Makes me think of the little boy that approached it this way. He said, now I set me down to sleep. The sermon's long, the subject's deep. If he should quit before I wake, somebody give me a little shake. <laughs> you know, as we think about so many things, Jim, did you catch that he called us heavy heater hitters? He called us heavy. I heard him. I mean, I wish this light up here would maybe make us a little bit more slender or something of that nature. When we talk about a lot of different things, you know, I was thinking this morning, Ben spoke at 10 o'clock, he's a young man. David spoke at 11 o'clock, he's a young man. Brandon spoke at 2 o'clock, he's a young man. Jim, us young folks really like our association with you, older preachers. It's really, really fun. It's a lot of fun. In fact, when we think about all of the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, when we think about the privileges that we have in being here tonight, when I think of the association I have with Jim Laws and Brother Perry and Maxie and so many others, men that I love so much, those that are faithfully standing for what is right, throughout the brotherhood they're known for that faithfulness. I love and appreciate being a part of and being associated with many of you in that way. It is our delight to be here. Brandon came for the first time this time, and I was so honored to be on that same lectureship with he and his cohorts, as it were, of all of the list on that particular lectureship. I'm proud to have Brandon at East Hill. I'm proud of these young men that I alluded to, three or four, just today, when we look at the church and the bombarding attacks that are being made, but we see those young men that have been trained, have their feet solidly on the ground, and are determined to preach the truth. It's encouraging, truly, to know that we are, as it were, preparing for our children, grandchildren, and those that shall follow the Lord willing. Each time I stand here, I make reference to the lectureship at Pulaski, Tennessee. May the 14th through the 18th, I believe it is, this coming year is going to be on speaking the truth in love. I know that rings a familiar sound to you. My dad had a bulletin for back in the 50s until the time of his death in 1980 called the truth in love. We put out a publication for 16 years called the truth in love. And thus this year, our lectureship is going to focus on the truth and how indeed it affects us these days. About seven-year-old child, sitting about where this gentleman is here. You know, if you've heard me preach, you know I only have one speed. That's usually wide open after it gets started. Well, that Sunday morning, I was going just, I was moving my hands and I was walking about and going about 90 miles an hour. He was visiting there with his grandmother. And he leaned over and he punched Laney and he said, Laney, and you think I need Ritalin? He said, he needs it worse than I. <laughs> oh, by the time I get through, you may think that as well as far as all of this is concerned. Let's think in terms of the great lessons that we have from the Old Testament. So many great things can be learned. What a great theme and no doubt each lesson beneficial. Romans chapter 15. We are told that whatsoever things were written aforetime, written for our learning. And as we focus on the statement that Balaam made and the great lesson that we can glean from that, it is worthy of that rich and great application to our lives. Though we live so far removed from that particular time, there's so much in the Old Testament as well as certainly the new perfect law that we can benefit from. As I look to Noah, Moses, Abraham, and so many others, and Balaam, we say, we don't know that great much about him in comparison to many of the others. But no doubt there's a great deal that we can learn as it pertains to these lessons, especially focusing on Numbers 23 and verse 10. He made that great statement concerning, Let me die the death of the righteous. Three weeks ago, Brandon was preaching on Sunday morning at the East Hill Church. We were nearing the end of the year. He was talking about the normal course of time and how that it's very common 
in the course of a year, 10 to 12 or so of our congregation, our family, to depart in death. Less than 24 hours later, one that was sitting about right over here in proportion to the congregation went into eternity. We talk about death sometimes flippantly. We try to avoid it at times, but it's a reality. And Balaam indeed was entering into the idea of and posing for us even tonight the idea of will we die the death of a righteous, a righteous servant, a righteous follower. And it would be well, no doubt, for us to even look at the Holy Scriptures pertaining to what is involved. What does the Bible have to say? How do we define it to begin with? How does it affect my life? And when we begin to see that righteousness is from God, found in Jesus Christ, that which we are to follow after, God loving it, the blessed are righteous. Indeed, the prayers of the righteous are those whom the Lord hears, righteousness enduring forever, and how we are being admonished to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, and that we are to daily grow in righteousness, and the righteous shall inherit heaven. Just to tap, as it were, just a few of these precious passages. I look at just these facts. I understand more concerning what it would mean for me having drawn my last breath, having died from my earthly sojourn, departing in death. James chapter 2 talks about how that the body without the spirit is dead, Death comes when that body, as it were, leaves or dies, and the spirit, which of course shall live forever. But this gives me, as it were, a capsule overview of what it would mean to die, as it were, a righteous one. Let's look at some additional facts. To, little, uh, to look at the context in just at least a brief time will help us to understand, as it were, a little bit more concerning what we're talking about. When we look at Balaam, who was a prominent, powerful individual, he was one that truly, could it, be, it could be said, was well, an elite of that day. But according to that which we have revealed in Scripture, he was obsessed, as it were, concerning that of honor and concerning that of wealth, wanting more and giving emphasis to the idea of wanting his way, not so much instead of God's way. Now, having said that, if I were to read, and we're going to do so in just a moment, several passages, quotes, directly, statements that he made, you think, are you talking about the same one? You're surely quoting someone else. If we're saying now, as it pertains to this particular one who has done that, we could talk about the events that led up to this time. For an, exact, uh, for an example, Balak sins for Balaam. He has heard concerning the enormity of what has taken place, the Amorites being destroyed. He's concerned, as it were, concerning even his own welfare, and he wants Balaam to help in defeating Israel. Thus, we look at that particular appeal. He comes to, he talks to, and the princes entice him. You can almost imagine the negotiation. You can think in terms of what had happened. He has brought before and shown what he might have if he will help in the defeating of Israel. And he responds in a very positive way. In fact, we can notice, if this will work next, Balaam responded righteously. He made some statements concerning, we'll look at the scripture in just a moment. He made some statements concerning, no matter what you offer me, concerning gold and silver or anything else, I cannot do, I will not do, that which the Lord has not authorized me. But then, of course, princes come again, enticing them even more, looking at that which they want, being sent, being given the charge, and he laid before him again the idea of what he could receive individually. He again is faithful to Jehovah in the statements that he makes, but ultimately in the temptation persisting to the point that he yielded. At one time in his life, very faithful. Statements that are made that are certainly the epitome of what we should have as our desire. 
But later on, having yielded, we're going to see how his life ended. You know, in actuality, it would have been better if Balaam had died at that earlier time in his life. Someone has made the statement that some live too long, some die too soon. In Balaam's case, he lived too long. There are others that die too soon, not having yet obeyed. Felix, for an example, put off, delayed. Others in the New Testament of which we can read, and the Old Testament as well, how that indeed they maybe had the best of intentions, but not, did not ever get around to, eventually did not obey God. As it pertains to Balaam, let's look at the times, just a brief overview of several of the passages. I invite you to read with me. As it pertains to statements that he made... In Numbers chapter 22 and verse 8, when he makes the statement, that as the Lord shall speak unto me, that's exactly what I'm going to bring as the word again to you. Whatever the Lord says. Folks, when we talk about the word of God and we have this book and we love this book and we try to teach this book, whatever the Lord says, see how it applies and can apply to us? What even Balaam said, Balaam also said, for the Lord refuseth to give leave to me to go with you. In other words, the Lord has said, I shouldn't go. I'm not going to go. What an attitude again. A great submissive attitude as it pertains to what God had said. God said, I can't go. Not going to go. I'm going to do exactly what the Lord said. He said, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. The attitude that should permeate our teaching, our preaching today. Whatever God says, that's what I'll teach. I'll not go beyond it. I'll not add to it. I'll not take away from it. Whatever the Lord said, I won't go beyond the word of the Lord my God. Then he made the statement, willingly, submissively, penitently, I've sinned. You know how few times that is found in the Holy Scriptures? Very few. You'd think it'd be more, but it is not. Balaam had the will. He had the heart, the attitude, to be willing to say, I have sinned. We add to that the idea where he said, the word that God put in my mouth, that shall I speak. Do you get what I was saying a moment, a moment ago, a little bit more Im impact now in our minds concerning the fact during this particular time, so righteous, so faithful, the statements that he made was so straight down the line, exactly what we would think would be a faithful servant of God. He added also, he said, Whatsoever he showeth me, I'll tell thee. He made the statement also, Whom the Lord hath not cursed, how shall I defy? How shall I curse? How can I go against God? Balak was trying to get his help in destroying, as it were, that which God was not set against. Balaam wisely stated, How can I possibly be a part of that which God is not we add to that also in Numbers 23 and verse 12. Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? We've already read that in some form two or three times, haven't we? Do we not get, as it were, that overbearing, overwhelming message concerning what he says and God has recorded for us that we might benefit? Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. He then made the statement, all that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. I'm going to do exactly what God said do. I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord. What the Lord saith, that will I speak. We're noticing Numbers chapter 22, 23, and 24. Three different chapters over a span of time, no doubt. The princes having come, enticed him. He responded positively faithfully, loyally to God. They enticed him again. He responded favorably, positively, loyally to God. So do we conclude that he died the death of the righteous? Tragically. The truth of the matter is, when we go to the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, it's beautiful to see time and again the old and the new so blended so perfectly together to find that faith-building fact concerning the statements that Simon Peter and Jude and others made concerning Balaam, an Old Testament character. But from the Old Testament, for an example, we can see that he yielded to Satan's snares. He died at the hands of the soldiers of Israel. 
And according to the testimony of the word of God, it was while he was with the evil Midianites. It's interesting that we find in Numbers 31, Balaam specifically, explicitly mentioned as being a part of the ones that are utterly destroyed. He's one of the ones that died. And God, as it were, had us to recognize, to, as it were, draw attention to. Balaam was one of the ones who was there, who had given in, who had said some fateful things, but it yielded to the temptation. The New Testament likewise emphasizes that. 2 Peter chapter 2, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozah, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Here was one concerning the one that it followed, and he was just using him as an illustration. He was saying, in the same way that Balaam, you've gone the same way. He loved the wages of the price that he secured as a result of being unrighteous. Contrary to that which God desires. We can also notice in Jude chapter 11, uh, Jude verse 11, how that he ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. We add to that in Revelation 2 and verse 14 concerning the reference that is made in the, one of the letters to the seven churches of Asia concerning holding the doctrine of Balaam. Old Testament as well as New Testament then we find tragically, so sadly, he did not die as he had desired. What's the lessons we can glean from all of this? I would suggest that he had the desire. We must first have the desire. We must have the longing. We must want to go to heaven. We must want it passionately, understanding that this world is brief, an earthly sojourn, passing through, not here. We must learn of and then desire to go to heaven, but then we must do. We cannot just merely say, I want to go there. As was pointed out this afternoon, it's so easy to want, as it were, to concerning that of wanting to go there, but not willing to pay the price, not willing to do what is required in order to bring that to fruition, to make it a reality. Balaam had the desire to die the death of the righteous. He had that image, he had the example before him, but he wasn't willing to pay the price. You see, not, it is not enough to merely start. We must rather remain faithful, that is, finish the journey. But Don and Brandon and I left Pulaski, Tennessee, 700 miles approximately from here. And it wasn't enough to merely get in the automobile, start down the road, go 30 or 40 miles, even 100 miles, over to Memphis a couple of hundred miles, not insulting your intelligence. I'm not meaning to. I'm just merely saying in order to be at this place at this particular time, we had to finish the journey. In order to have a desire for heaven, we must complete the journey, enduring to the end, remaining faithful to God. You see, Balaam had the desire, maybe started as it were, made all of the great statements, but he didn't die as the righteous. We've got to make sure we don't leave the door open to sin. He did that. Somebody says, well, wait a minute, Paul, how, how do you... Well, he kept listening to the apprentice. He gave them an audience. He dang, they dangled the enticements before him. Joseph ran, fled from Potiphar's wife. There are other times in Scripture where we're admonished to flee. It's not cowardly to run away from sin. It shows strength and courage and determination to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not even going to listen. He left the door open. If he had said no, and I mean no, and I, I'm not going to even listen to you, look at how the story could have ended so differently. We've got to make sure that we're not hearing the enticements of Satan. Well, all the rest of them are doing it. You're, you're, you're missing out. You know that, don't you? I mean, man, they're having a good time. 
And, and, and besides, no one would know. Uh, you've got time to correct and to set the record straight to do after you sow your wild oats. Satan t entices, seeks to ensnare. He wants to trap. He wants to destroy. He wants captive you in his hands, as it were. The world's enticements, though, are only temporary. Whatever honor, whatever wealth, whatever he might have secured, he left behind when he died. Dear people, we need that lesson. We need that indelibly etched in our minds to recognize that what we have, whatever, however great, however little, it matters not. When we draw our last breath, nothing we have, all of the land in Texas, all of the wealth that we might ever imagine, all of the millions of dollars that could ever be ac accumulated by one family or one individual, you leave behind. It'll all soon vanish. It'll soon be destroyed. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 and 10, the earth and all of the elements therein shall melt with fervent heat. Dare we be so foolish as to think, to put all of our efforts and our energies, our time into things that will not last? Somebody has posed it this way. Vanishing ink was pretty cool some years ago you'd write with a pen and it would be there and then it would go away what if money was like that would we dare then work and slave and endeavor and try to do the best we can and then it would disappear but in actuality that's what's going to happen you see in our existence brief as it is on this earth our life here is but as a vapor, James chapter 4 says. We understand that indeed we are to lay up treasures in heaven, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6. We brought nothing into this world, we'll carry nothing out, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are merely stewards over whatever we have for a brief time soon to pass on to someone else. And all of the honor and the wealth and anything that might be enjoyed or accumulated even Soon will be gone. Balaam sold out and died as an evil one, not as a righteous person of God for these things. We learn also that God's word is serious. We can't trifle with it. It's not to be trivialized. The Bible indeed tells us over and over, God has spoken God means what he says. We're not to add to it or take away from it. We're not in any way to say, well, I think this is all right. I don't like that, so I'm going to leave that alone, and this I'll accept. If we're doing such with God's word, in actuality, we've thrown it all away because we put ourselves, as it were, in the driver's seat and say, I'm going to take this, but I'm not going to take that. In actuality, we have not accepted any of it because it is authority. It is the sole rule of our life. And he's our ruling in our life. We must make sure that we do not trivialize what God has spoken. In the first part of the Bible, in the middle part of the Bible, in the last part of the Bible, as the way we have it organized, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and Revelation, we find, add thou not, don't take away from, don't put in a, a something that's not there. God intends for us to do what he says, nothing else, nothing more. Balaam didn't respect that. We learn also that obedience is absolutely essential. It's the ultimate and the only all-important matter in life. When you draw your last breath, dear people, it's not going to matter how much you've got in your bank account. It's not going to matter how many plaques and awards that you've won throughout life. I challenge each of us to go to bed tonight, as it were, saved in the sight of God, obedient in the sight of God, because if we draw our last breath, that's all that will matter. 
We learn from Balaam that the righteous can fall. How dare us to ever be so cocky and arrogant as to think that we are on stable ground and don't have anything to worry about. And you see, at one point, he was righteous. At one point, we can be righteous. We can sing, oh, how I love Jesus. We can serve him faithfully. We can be involved in the work. We can go and tell other people. We can invite others and tell them the gospel good news. We can help. We can eventually be lost. Paul made the statement, take heed. Those that stand, lest you fall. Why do we have passage after passage challenging us, provoking us, helping us to see? Take heed, watch out, be on guard. You know, make sure that your roots are down deep, but you stay on stable ground, that you keep your head, as it were, above the waters of temptation and ensnarements and all the difficulties of life. It's possible to be overcome and entangled Again, Simon Peter said, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Demas loved the present world, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. There were various others of the disciples of Christ. John chapter 6 and verse 66, some followed him no more. They weren't willing to pay the price. Folks, it cost to be a child of God. There are sacrifices that are incumbent upon us to make sure that we are faithfully following him, giving, as it were, our life, our time, our all. Paul made the statement, Christ, who is my life, he'll accept nothing less. Some are not willing to pay that. They have this image of, I want to go to heaven. I want to, oh, how wonderful it'll be. But like Balaam, they make some statements, but then don't carry it out. Death is inevitable. You're going to die. If the doctor, if I'd have had a doctor appointment today, if you'd had a doctor appointment today, and let's say that he came back in in a somber face, and he says, Paul, I, I, the test, they tell me some things I, I just don't like. You've got this fatal disease, and there's not anything that I can do. Some of my friends, and no doubt yours, have heard that type of message. But you know what? We're all fatal. We're all going to die. I don't know when. The one that departed in death just a few days ago, as he left that Sunday morning service, I talked to him over the corner. You see, he wasn't faithful. And a mere few hours before he died, I talked with him about coming back and getting his life right. Oh, he knew he was going to die. He just didn't think it was going to be soon. How many times have we stood over the casket at the graveside of others who likewise thought they were living forever, almost? teenager not long ago at the funeral service. How many times could we talk about the young who think I've got my whole life in front of me? Not realizing the inches that they are away from death every time they drive and meet a car on coming. Death is inevitable. It's an appointment that we're going to keep. We may not keep some appointments. That's one that we will. He's appointed that day in which he's going to judge the world. The Lord will return. And he'll find scoffers who are saying arrogantly, oh, don't, don't worry about it. You know, we got plenty of time. He's not going to come right now. Why? We are even maybe guilty of having the thought go through our minds, even if we don't verbalize it. Why, well, it's been so long. I've got plenty of time. It's been almost 2,000 years. I mean, he's not going to come right now in my lifetime. Maybe not. But how do you know that? I think I've told you before of the tragic event that took place there in Giles County. Brother Keith Mosier was in a gospel meeting Sunday through Wednesday and Tuesday night. Many of us were gathered together, including one precious 57-year-old teacher. She went to work the next morning. 
She died a few minutes later. Carolyn never dreamed that that would be her last day. We didn't either. One Monday morning, LaDon came to the office. We lived in St. Louis, Missouri early that morning. I knew something was wrong as soon as I saw her face. And she could only say, Paul, your dad died this morning. He had had open heart surgery four and a half years ago. We knew the doctors had told us diseased heart. Nothing can be done. Maybe four to six years, then five years almost. But we're never ready for that appointment as it were. It seems as if we're postponing, pushing it off, thinking that it's not going to happen. We learn from Balaam that indeed to merely say I want to die the death of the righteous and to acknowledge the reality of death is not enough. All knowledgeable people want to die as the righteous. If we have any knowledge at all of that book, of the Word of God, young people as well as those precious older ones, you surely want to die that way. But the truth of the matter is, our spiritual condition at the time of our death or at the time of the Lord's returning indeed will determine our destiny. If I'm outside of Christ, I'm not going to die as a righteous. If I am deed as an erring child of God, having obeyed the gospel, rejected though, turned away back into sin, overcome, entangled again, all of the words that we find in the Holy Scriptures, I'm not righteous. I'm not ready to meet Him. That appointment may come, but I'm not prepared. My spiritual condition at that time, your spiritual condition at the time of your death determines. You determine your destiny. Folks, how do we die the death of the righteous? Let's quickly look at this particular three-point thrust. In order to die as a righteous, obedient, submissive, loving follower of Christ, I must look to the right place. You see, I, I recognize God gave His only Son. Jesus died that all might live. And the Spirit has provided the instruction, the Word of God, the inspired Scripture. I must go to the right place. Not to my own intelligence. I can't do it. Not to the general population, as Brandon pointed out earlier today. That will not get it. I can maybe be following the masses straight to destruction. I've got to go to the right place. The one who can offer salvation and bring about the promises that he's made is God only. Godhead. I must indeed be in the right place. The place of safety for children today, for people today who live today is in the church. In the days of Noah, the place of safety was in the ark. In the time when the tenth plague was about to come, it was in the house with the blood on the post and staying in the house. And having eaten all of the meat and all the other requirements, rigid instructions having been followed, it was in that house. You had to be in the house or the firstborn would die. As it pertains also to various other times in history where we can talk about the cities of refuge or we can talk about sailing with Paul, Acts chapter 27, and the place was in the boat. The place of safety. All that sailed with Paul, God had said, you're going to be safe. You get out of the boat, you're not going to be safe. The place of safety for us is in the church. The bride of Christ. If I want to die as a righteous today, I cannot do it anywhere else. Not in denominationalism, not in humanism, not in materialism, in worldlyism, any other isms that there are might be itemized. It's the body of Christ. The saved are in. The righteous are in the body of Christ. And I must stay there. In order to be acceptable, dying the death of the righteous, I must, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, 
endure to the end to be saved. Revelation 2 and verse 10, the latter part, be faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. I must make sure that I press toward that prize, looking to, going for, working, endeavoring, striving, longing, passionately, seeking to get the crown that has been promised. I've got to get in the right place and stay in the right place to die the death of the righteous. Let's think of it this way. When I hear a little bit about the gospel, I see a mansion in the distance. I don't appreciate it like others who have worked for and striven to make it a reality for so many years, but it's so appealing. A place where there's no death, no pain, no sorrow, no crying. All the former things are gone. I see it in a distance. And as a result of seeing that, I, I start the journey. Believing with all of my heart, repenting of my sins, confessing Him before men, and, and being baptized. I start that journey. He adds me to His church. And I worship. I serve. And as a result, I begin to see more clearly that home. And to recognize that my earthly sojourn is not really what I had thought before. This is becoming more and more important. And thus I see it clearer. I endure. I'm faithful. I press on. Because it becomes clearer and clearer concerning that home that Jesus said I've gone to prepare for you. John chapter 14. That home that I know He has promised to His faithful, the redeemed, reconciled ones. And I realize as I grow older, I'm clearer, I can see it clearer, and I'm closer. Even to the point of saying at times I'm almost home. Not, not perfect, none of us can ever be. But based upon the precious, exceeding, and great promises that our Savior has made, we can know it's prepared for us. And the mansion for which I've endeavored, that I have seen at a distance, that it's drawn closer and closer, and now I can confidently believe and be almost, as it were, home and know that there will be no pain and sorrow, death, no end, no, and all will be rest and joy, the end of the trials and troubles and temptations of life. We might compare it to this way. The soldier on that foreign soil and he's thinking of home but his commander in chief and he follows that commander in chief and he serves faithfully and loyally because he's fighting for a good cause freedom things that we sometimes take for granted but he has home in mind he's on a distant land fighting for a good cause obedient and faithful whatever he's called upon to do and then we compare the soldier of Christ who's likewise on a foreign soil this earth is not our home we're also thinking of home but Jesus Christ our commander in chief we're loyal to and whatever he says do we'll do it because we've got clearly focused in our minds See, our earthly home is out of this world. But we've got to be in Christ. We cannot be in darkness. We cannot be a part of this world. This world is soon going to end. But the redeemed will go home. Listen so well, but for just a few seconds more. It says 21 over here. Are you righteous? Are you ready? Are you in Christ? Are you ready to die the death of?
of the righteous. If not, come as we stand and sing.